So I'm going to jump right in, Raj. Um, body and face surgeries seem like almost a side dish when it comes to conversations about beauty, especially while we are discussing celebrities. And keeping in mind our very conventional and conditional judgment around bodies, um, do you think plastic surgery is, equ is a boon or do you think it's a bane for this generation that's all about self-love? Um, I, I think that's a very good question, so I'll to start with. Uh, I think it's a boon and a bane. The boon is the fact that it does bring self-confidence, self-esteem, and for those who are in TV, media, and film, uh, patients like mine, it does bring a lot of confidence back to them, and it, increase, it boosts their um, performance in general. The bane is that one can get carried away, and there are instances where I turn down two or three out of five patients who may come to me asking for surgery, but I don't think they quite need them. So the bane really is that you're chasing an ideal which may not be achievable or not appropriate for you. So when you say celebrities, those who come to you, are we naming names here? Or is it too early in the conversation? We're too early in our conversation for me okay, to do that. Okay, I, I will take you up on that in a few <laughs> minutes. Um, so need versus wants, uh, where do plastic surgeries fall? Celebrities like Chrissy Teigen, Bella Hadid have openly admitted to having plastic surgery done and this kind of openness wasn't the case until a few years ago. So when did suddenly plastic surgery fall into the essentials uh, cart, just like an avocado suddenly fell into an essentials cart? So let me just clarify here, plastic surgery is an umbrella term and it incorporates reconstruction and cosmetic. Reconstruction is uh, kids born with, born with cleft lips. Uh, cancer reconstruction after mastectomy, or reconstruction after burns. So that's reconstruction. Cosmetic is, of course, the walking well who walk into my clinic and who want to en enhance their looks and their beauty. So cosmetic per se, rather than, if I may correct you, it's not quite uh, essential, it's desirable. So that is something that's very personal, which is why uh, when cosmetic surgery is carried out by us, it's very important to do it in the context of the whole being, not just the physical characteristics, but the patient's uh, persona, the personality, and their context within the environment. So is there an overlap between this need versus want, cosmetic surgery versus plastic surgery? Do these worlds come together ever? There is a huge overlap, yeah, because plastic surgery essentially is form and function. And of course, there's a huge overlap in between. In fact, I'd go as far as saying that if you are choosing a, a surgeon to have cosmetic surgery with, it's very important to look at their reconstructive background as well. Because if you're a reconstructor, you are that much more apt at dealing with body parts. You're that much apt at looking at the whole three or 40 parts of the body. So where do then mommy makeovers fall? Is it a need to go for a mommy makeover and, or is it a want? So you, you probably picked that up from my website and from my Instagram because yeah. I'm known for my mommy makeovers. What is and a mommy makeover to start with? Yeah. So this is an interesting uh, uh, speciality which I have pioneered, which essentially is ladies in their 30s and 40s who've had two or three children, especially if they're breastfed, then the breasts lose their uh, youthfulness and they fall southwards. The tummy becomes loose and lax. The muscles separate. So I do what's called a mummy makeover, where literally it's a four or five hour operation, six to eight week recovery, and I literally restore youthfulness to their chest and the abdominal wall and the hip to waist ratio, all done in one operation. And this is a perfect um, hybrid of uh, need and want, because of course the pregnancies do tend to disrupt your abdominal wall and the breasts after breastfeeding. So you're doing it partly aesthetic and partly function as well. Okay, um, you know, but before I ask you my next question, um, there is a reel that I wanted to play to show you and I needed your opinion on it. Can we play that, please? We started right from this to this by making changes to our face to plastic surgery procedures. My face is untouched. Yeah, this is untouched. Yes, that is a big lie. Yeah, it's fair. Nothing is natural. Let's record what she has done. As we can see from this picture, the most permanent change is in her nose. Her transformation from a broader to a structure and slender nose is very remarkable. It is very evident that she must have undergone private plastic surgery. And another noticeable aspect is her jawline. In earlier picture, it looks long and out of proportion, and now she has very well contoured jawline, which complements. 
my question for you is indian celebrities are still not very vocal about getting a job done and firstly how true are these reels and um, secondly um, do people realize that you know um, this is an ongoing process it's not a one shot fix and they'll have to keep going to the surgeon again and again and again so on to your first question i mean it, it looks like a a genuine reel but what i can't tell you is whether the pictures are doctored or not and this is where the problem is and so for an average patient looking at that you know great guy great surgeon great results but i think it's very important to look beyond the instagram pictures and to visit the surgeon look at the credentials look at the clinic and to look at their experience in terms of their own photographs undoctored that's your answer to your first question the second one is uh, sorry what was your second question the second question is that do people realize that this is an ongoing process it's not a one uh, cure it all fix where you get one injection and then you are young forever it's an ongoing process and it requires a lot of commitment to sure. look good yeah i mean non surgical and surgical treatments are not forever they the non surgical treatments can last up to 6 months to a year and have to be replenished surgical treatments last longer but they're not lifelong and it's very important that a patient who's getting into these treatments knows that so you have to keep on maintaining yourself uh, in order to make sure that you keep the results so it's not a it's not a one stop solution Th the other thing is it's not just about treatments it's about your whole well being so in terms of your eating healthy sleeping well hydration skin care and stress i think stress is an, is underrated and it's very important to have all these factors in play if you're going to have a healthy lifestyle and plastic surgery is only one component of it so it it's interesting you say all of this because when we do uh, interviews with a lot of celebrities we get all of that i sleep well i drink water i eat vegetables all of that but the main thing that is i get a botox or i've got you know rhinoplasty that's always skipped out so this is so you've actually given us the whole prescription here of how yeah, to look absolutely yeah it's like a zillion one bucks stop, yeah, yeah. okay um what about ethics um you know and how do they come into play uh, for a surgeon especially when you're operating on a celebrity do you kind of have to be uh, a certain way or are there some do's and don'ts sign your ndas etc so look I, i treat every patient equally when a celebrity walks in when a princess walks in for me they're a patient and it's very important as a surgeon as a clinician to look at them as a patient because otherwise what happens is your views and your assessment are biased and they're skewed and they shouldn't be plastic surgery is serious stuff be it non surgical or surgical and needs to be done seriously and carefully so to answer your question it's very important to assess them as individual patients and if you feel that you they don't deserve the surgery for whatever reason either because then they don't need it or because their expectations are too high and i can't meet them or because they're medically unsafe to have surgery then it's very important to be open and honest about this and this is where problems happen is where surgeons tend to transgress that line and go into territories where they're slightly rocky have you had to turn down a patient because the expectations were very high and what are the kind of expectations they do people come with is it like an interior decorators uh, you know shop where you go with your pinterest mood board and say this is what i want to look like like i want kim kardashian's face and i want bella hadid's cheeks and deepika padukone's lips how does that work so that's that's a very good point i mean i i turned down two or three out of five patients how, sorry how many two to three out of five patients i turned down because okay. i really want to make sure that they've done their homework and their expectations are realistic because if the expectations are here and my ability to do is here that gap is too wide and it's and that's when problems arise so it's very important that the patient's expectations are realistic so for example um you know I saw a patient the other day who's got a perfectly good hip to waist ratio perfectly good figure wanted to have buttocks like Kim Kardashian is and this a is this a bollywood celebrity because it sounds like one <laughs> Uh, I think I'll carry on talking. So so essentially when it came to this I assessed her and I said to her listen your take off of the buttocks from the waist and your uh, apex point and the curve down to the thighs is very good and commensurate with the rest of your physique. You don't need it. You know I and the other point I'm, I'll make here is that I don't like to operate and give results that I don't like myself. So I don't like that Kim Kardashian butter. So I don't like that shelf. So I will always be true to myself true to the patient and only do procedures where i feel that they deserve or need them okay 
can I request you to your mic? Yeah, thank you. Um, okay, so I have a little bit of a personal question. Can you tell me about what have you got done? Um, <clears throat> uh, like to know. I'm, I'm blessed with great genes. You drink water, let uh, me I guess. Drink, I drink lots of water. Um, and the odd adjustment, of course, doesn't go straight, does it? <laughs> So you're not going to name the celebrities, you're not going to tell us what you've gotten done, you're really having it easy. Okay, so the trend of getting quick fix surgeries started off in the West, we all know that. And you'd often, like we'd often hear of celebrities flying off to London, to LA for, for some kind of a job. And so the standards of beauty are very much still decided by the West. Um, with so much beauty in every culture and facial nuances being so diverse in every culture, like a Zendaya cannot look like Angelina Jolie. Um, why is it that still a white woman or a white man is still my gold standard for beauty? I haven't got all day to answer this question. This is a very good question. But I'm going to say to you one thing, which is, and it's a, uh, a term that we all are, have heard of, beauty is in the eye of the beholder. And it's very important to know that. And secondly, that those ideals of the white woman and the white face and so on are all gone. Plastic surgery is international. Plastic surgery is out there. And of course, social media is the uh, main vehicle by which plastic surgery is now exposed all around the world. So there's no, uh, uh, there's no kind of typical patient that you can aspire to now. There are lots of figures out there. I mean, of course, I can name a few Indian women uh, who, are, uh, who are aspirational in terms of their physique, in terms of their bone structure, in terms of their skin. So I think it's not just uh, the, the West now. I think this is now universal. So is there a certain culture or a country you would say that has the most botched up job? Like you always see like Russian women with a certain kind of a lip or women in some countries with a certain kind of nose and everyone's getting the same thing done and everyone's looking like each other if you yeah. see at the back. Um, tell us which country has great aesthetics when it comes to plastic surgeries and which ones are getting it all wrong. I think social media has lots of benefits, but the one thing that it does do is making everyone look the same. The same lips, the same trout pout, the same cheeks. So to answer your question specifically, there is no country as such that has bot jobs or that has jobs that are a bit more wider and so on. I mean, I will say I'm trained in the States, so I will say to you something. In the States, when plastic surgery is done, the patient wants to tell other, other people I've had plastic surgery done. So the surgeons almost lend themselves to that, and the breast implants are bigger, the cheeks are, uh, are fuller, uh, the buttocks are wider. So it's, it is cultural. In the States, I would say it's a bit more open, whereas we in London are very measured, uh, very uh, subtle in the, in the results we deliver, because the average patient doesn't want to tell their neighbor or their friend that they've had plastic surgery done. They just want to feel good, look good in themselves, and gain that inner confidence. What about Indian women? What are the kind of things that they want to do? How do they want to look? What are the kind of requests that they come to you with? Um, so again, it's that question is age-specific. So the middle-aged women want to uplift the breasts and reduce the breasts and just regain the hip-to-waist ratio in terms of their hip uh, diameter and so on. So it's more about body contouring and breasts. The younger women are after the nose. The younger women are after the breasts in terms of enhancement. Do you think Indian women don't have pretty noses? No, no, I think, I think I mean, of course, there are lots of ethnic differences. There's a lot of differences in terms of geography. So, you know, there's the northern nose or the southern nose. Uh, there are lots of differences, and it's very important as a surgeon to appreciate that, which is why the nose or the eyes or the breast is put in context with the rest of the patient. Okay. Um, so for a change, um, when it comes to plastic surgeries and the rise in sudden requests for plastic surgeries, the age is getting, um, you know, younger by the day. Um, for, for a change, we're not blaming pharma companies. We are not blaming big billboards that we blame for all the problems in the world. But actually the problem, or I would say the inspiration comes from social media. The phone in my hand is suddenly making me want to look a certain way, is making everybody want to look like each other. Um, what do you have to say about the role of social media when it comes to people's choices to look in a certain way? Well, this is a great question, Sonal. I mean, social media now is the biggest platform and the biggest moderator of plastic surgery in the world. And, of course, it's a friend and a foe. 
it, it is a friend because the potential patient can, can have a look on it and be able to get lots of information on the procedure, on the risks and benefits, and of course, they can get a whole write-up on the surgeon themselves. In fact, I'd go as far as saying that social media has upped our game as surgeons as well, because we know now that the results are out there straight away. There is no hiding the fact that as soon as you do the procedure, the patients are going to be out there taking selfies and putting them up on, on, on the internet. So it's, it's actually a game changer, not just for the patients, but for us as well. And that's, that's a good thing, because it means that we are accountable and we are appraised from the work we do. The bad thing about social media is what I mentioned earlier, is everyone's beginning to look the same, which is, which is a bit of a shame because you lose your identity. But the other thing is that it does increase the expectations of the patient. Uh, patients you know, have certain ideals that they aspire to, and they may not necessarily be able to get to that end goal. But they come to me, I mean, lots of patients come to me with pictures from the internet, from the social media, and say, Mr. Raghavansi, I'd like to look like this. And of course, that's great. It's nice to have some kind of a benchmark, but it does raise the expectation somewhat, and it's upon the surgeon to make sure that if he or she is operating on them, that that expectation is met. Because if it's not, that then produces the disgruntled patient. So it's interesting you say that because one thing I wonder is when somebody changes their face, when somebody gets surgery done, does it also affect their brain in some way? <laughs> um, I mean, in psychologically and mental well-being is a plus. When you're doing plastic surgery with the right person, at the right clinic, at the right time, for the right reason, then actually it can be a huge boost to your confidence and self-esteem. And I've seen that so many times. And that is the best thing you can have. You know, you can have a woman who walks in uh, as a consultation and is meek and humble and trying to wear a top to cover her chest, who six weeks later walks in confident, uh, shoulders held up high, speaks well, and you know, and sits well, and you know that that particular procedure has added confidence and value to, to their well-being. So um, recently, in a Harper's Bazaar interview, it was our cover story where Karina Kapoor said that she does not feel the need to get Botox done as she grows older. Mm. What are your thoughts on such a radical statement in this day and age? And according to a plastic surgeon, a celebrity plastic surgeon at that, what does perfection even mean? Um, look, plastic surgery, cosmetic surgery, is the perfect marriage between art and science. And there are scientific parameters of what a face or a nose should look like or be within. And if I was to go into in detail, Fibonacci in the 13th century, as long ago as that, actually devised angles and proportions of the face and the body, and those still hold true for now. So the ideal face and ideal body characteristics are now scientifically proven. But on top of that, there's that added kind of artistry to plastic surgery because you not only take into account the physical characteristics, you take into account the patient's, uh, uh, the way the patient is, the patient's uh, behavior, the, the patient's context and what they do and their social environment. So speaking of Karina Kapoor, um, I have, my wife's a Bollywood buff, so I, I, know, I know about Karina Kapoor, and she is, I would say, in terms of, pro I've, I've posed her a lot, and I've viewed her from certain angles, and she's got the most perfect face as far as scientifically proportionate face is concerned. So, for example, the, 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 the distance between the hairline to the brow, brow to the nose, and nose to the chin is in thirds, and it is with her. Oh, there she is, yeah. So it is in thirds. The other thing is that the width, width of the eye and the uh, width of the other eye equates to the distance between both inner eyes. So there is a fantastic proportion to her, and I would say she is the epitome of someone who is the ideal beauty. So, you know, there is this uh, viral meme on the internet that says another day's day goes by and I still haven't practiced algebra and geometry. I can't say that today because you've really made me go through a math class with Karina's geometry. On that note, thank you very much, Raj. It was an absolute pleasure chatting with you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.